Hi, it's Dwyer. It's August 11th, 2024. Gamblersadvisory.com, a free site. Bettingangle.us, a free site. Let's talk about the aftermath. That's what we'll call it. The aftermath of Virgil Ortiz versus Sergey Boachuk. But first, remember, the opinion you should follow should be your own. Just consider this video to be a second opinion from a complete stranger online. Now, the fights had fallout, right? For those who don't know, Boachuk, the champion entering the ring, knocks down Virgil Ortiz in two different rounds, right? Fights a spirited, we'll call it first two-thirds of the fight. If you look at the CompuBox numbers, you'll see that, you know, in some rounds, he's clearly landing as many punches as Virgil Ortiz. And understand, in a fight like this, you really can't go by CompuBox completely because of the ferocity of the punches. You're talking about a fight where a punch doesn't equal a punch because some punches were thudding. Some punches had more consequences than other punches. Right, so you look at the CompuBox numbers, you realize that uh, in two different rounds, the first round and I believe the eighth round, Boachuk gets knockdowns. So you realize several other rounds are competitive, and then somehow the judges want you to believe that Virgil Ortiz took the title. So you've had an outcry. You've had his eclat. His Excellency, Turkey al Sheikh, right, of Riyadh season, come out and say that while he had hoped that Ortiz would win so that he could match him with Terence Crawford, he can't insist on that fight anymore. He wants to see a rematch here between Ortiz and Boachuk, right, because he does not want Crawford, who, in my eyes, is the best in the sport pound for pound, to face a tainted champion. Right? Crawford really is the high bar. He's the standard. You don't want to water down that standard by having Crawford in against a guy who has some controversy or at least some uncertainty surrounding him. Now let's do something here that's going to be heresy in some circles. You know, I love the cards Riyadh Season has put on. Love them. I think Riyadh Season has been spectacular for the sport of boxing. Some of these cards, particularly the ones out of uh, Riyadh, are truly tremendous. You know, you're watching matchups you didn't think you would see. Right, Jili Zhang against Deontay Wilder. Joseph Parker against Deontay Wilder. Those fights were made possible because of Riyadh season, right? I, I have to say, uh, Turkey Al Al Sheikh has done a great job bringing people together. I was astonished when I heard that Jared Anderson had agreed to fight Martin Bacoli. I thought, you got to be kidding. And you understand those fights are only possible because the promoter is putting up the money. But here, boxing has another side. If I'm Virgil Ortiz, and I think Ortiz might be the best young prospect in the sport, let's be clear on that. Right? If I'm Virgil Ortiz, I never fight Boachuk again unless it's for a world title. Not an interim belt, but a world title belt. Also, not all the divisions are alike. Right? Some divisions are unsettled. 154 pounds, folks, is an unsettled division. Let's stop and think for a second. Who's the best at 154 pounds? I'm just telling you, you have different camps. Right? You have the camp that says, well, Sebastian Fundora beat Tim Zhu. That's the biggest recent fight in the division. 
to the victor goes the spoils. Fundora won that fight. Fundora is the best in the division. Right? You have a different group that says, wow, you know, the last time I looked, Jamel Charlo was unbeaten. He's the division's last undisputed champion. He's only lost outside of the division to a surefire first ballot Hall of Famer, somebody who many other people believe is the best in the sport pound for pound, Canelo. You have another group that says, hey, hey, let's slow down. Tim Zhu suffered a freak injury. A freak injury in that Fundora fight. And that fight was still close. A healthy Tim Zhu without the injury might be the king of the division. Right, so just to understand there are different arguments that can be made. I would argue too that there should even be a group that says, you know, Boa Chuck just beat Virgil Ortiz. Right? This level of front foot with an ability to prevent you from hitting him in the head with a jab that, quite frankly, was a big difference maker in his fight against Virgil Ortiz. Right? Ortiz has his own power jab, one of the best jabs in boxing. And then we found out that he really couldn't use it as much as he wanted because he was getting hit with an excellent jab coming back from Boachuk. So understand, you have decentralization at 154 pounds. Folks, both Ortiz and Boachuk trained with Manny Robles. Believe it or not, they've been in the ring sparring dozens of times before this fight was announced. There's a level of familiarity that many of the others at 154 don't have with Virgil Ortiz that Boachuk had. Right? Understand the problems Ortiz had in this fight were structural. Boachuk knew how to stop Ortiz from hitting him in the head. Boachuk knew how to counter Ortiz. Let me make another point here too. And this is really from the Martin Bacoli fight. You know, I always praise fighters here online for making adjustments during a fight. Sometimes the great strategic move is to not make the adjustment. In the Bacoli fight, Jared Anderson is hitting Bacoli to the body and Bacoli lets him because Bacoli has a plan. Have Jared Anderson leaning over, trying to hit him in the body, and then hit him with uppercuts. Bacoli's plan in not making the adjustment to cover up his body worked magnificently for him. Right now here, Boachuk makes a commitment to not allowing Virgil Ortiz to hit him in the head. He makes another commitment where he's going to be aggressive. He's going to be on his front foot. That's his core style. He's not going to be on his back foot trying to play dodgeball with Virgil Ortiz. Right? So he takes the risk that Ortiz won't be able to knock him out to the body. Don't get me wrong. He's hunched over. He has a high guard. But Ortiz is landing body shots. Boachuk never moves away from having that high guard covering up his head. He's clearly more concerned about his head than he is his body. So when you see a fight like this, folks, it's always going to be combustible. You understand. Boachuk's in his 20s, 29. Right? You understand that Boachuk is going to be a tougher opponent for Virgil Ortiz than almost anybody else in the division. The familiarity, the trade-offs, the jab, the fact that Boachuk now knows something nobody else professionally knows. Right? Go coming into this fight, Ortiz had an Arthur Baturbiev 100% KO ratio. 
Bobachuk is the one person on the planet who can say, I went the distance with Virgil Ortiz as a professional. Right, so if I'm Ortiz, I'm not the big bad wolf with Boa Chuck. We've gone 12 rounds, whatever the judges said, Boa Chuck believes he won the fight. I don't even have the benefit, just spiritually, of a victory over Boa Chuck. Right, the next time we're in the ring, it could be like Antonio Tarver against Roy Jones. In their rematch, where Tarver famously said to Jones, you know, what's your excuse tonight, Roy? Something like that. Right? Understand, Boa Chuck's not a believer in Virgil Ortiz's supposed supremacy. So Riyadh season wants them to fight a rematch. Right? As much as I appreciate promoters who pay top dollar. If I were advising Virgil Ortiz, and this is completely unsolicited advice, this is what boxing fans do, right? We fantasize about what we would do if we had the power, right? If I were advising Virgil Ortiz, if I'm Robert Garcia, if I'm Oscar De La Hoya and Bernard Hopkins, I would tell him, look, this is an unsettled division. Let's fight Tim Zhu in Australia. Let's spread our brand to Australia. Hell, we just saw Terence Crawford, who I'd avoid right now. But we just saw Terence Crawford struggle with Madrimov. Madrimov's still out there in the division. When do we fight Madrimov? A lot of curious boxing fans would want to watch that fight, wouldn't they? Right? Understand, Sebastian Fondora, according to rumors, is supposed to fight Errol Spence. Now, boxing has a where you're from component. You may have noticed on the back of Ortiz's trunks, he had some phrase, the best in Texas, or something like that. Right? Well, understand, Texas has a bunch of fighters, right? In fact, Robert Garcia, his trainer, trains a guy who's awfully good, who should be in the best of Texas conversation, Bam Rodriguez. Right? A guy who beat Sonny Edwards when Edwards was unbeaten. Well, understand, Ortiz believes he's the best in Texas. Hey, what about a guy named Errol Spence? Whoa, isn't Spence at 154 pounds too? You know, understand... <laughs> You can't call yourself the best in Texas when you might not be the best in Texas in your division. Ortiz against Errol Spence at Jerry Jones' arena in Texas. Folks, you're going to get a crowd there, especially if Spence beats Sebastian Fundora. The reason I wouldn't fight Crawford and going into this fight I personally thought Ortiz would beat Crawford, right? 154 is not 147. Ortiz has an excellent jab. But understand, Crawford is a different person every fight. Understand, these fights in the right hands can serve as blueprints for a boxer who knows what he's doing. Crawford now has 12 rounds of watching, in my opinion, Ortiz flounder. Right? Ortiz gets dropped twice in this fight, folks. Ortiz can't put his punches together. As I said, before the 10th round, Ortiz's own corner tells him, you know, you have to throw more than one punch at a time. Right? That's in a fight where the other guy is never knocked down. Right? Ortiz is loading up on shots. Ortiz is unable to hit Boa Chuck to the head. He's really relying on body shots in the fight. You can imagine Terrence Crawford with this tape, making notes, being a guy who has the skill set. Right? He's righty, he's lefty. He's front foot, he's back foot. 
He's head hunting. He's hitting you to the body. Right? Right now, if I'm Ortiz, I stay away from Crawford. At least until I figure a few things out. Right? Ortiz got his nose busted up this fight. Ortiz got cut on the side of his head. After the fight, he looked like he'd been in a fight. Right? Terrence Crawford's going to look at those wounds and he's going to realize, wow, you know, he couldn't handle Boachuk's jab. I beat Errol Spence coming in behind my jab. Can I copy some of the things Boachuk was doing? Understand, too, you only get these gifts decisions a few times in your career. Sooner or later, the public fights back. Right? As you can imagine, if Ortiz is in another tough fight like this, public sentiment's going to be different. He might not get the benefit of the doubt. So, believe it or not, you know, if I were Virgil Ortiz, I would pass on a Boa Chuck rematch. In part because Ortiz is in his mid-twenties. Even if a promotional group were to overpay him for the Boa Chuck rematch, he has to ask himself whether it's worth it because being in his mid-twenties, he has a longer-term horizon in mind. He's thinking about his career. And there's some high-paying fights, right? At the end of the day, it's the market that pays you. There's some high-paying fights out there against opponents who might not be in their prime like Boa Chuck is. How old is Errol Spence right now? Hasn't Errol Spence been in a major car crash? Hasn't Errol Spence had eye surgery? Isn't Errol Spence new to 154 pounds? Right now, I understand Spence has the bigger reputation than a Boa Chuck. From this seat, I think for Virgil Ortiz, Boa Chuck is the much tougher fight. Right? When's the last time Jamel Charlo was in the ring? Jamel Charlo is an ambush fighter. Right? He jumps in very fast hands, very accurate. He's episodic. So he jumps in, he hits you with tough shots, you're dazed and confused, then he's gone. You know what I've said here online for years. How do you beat an ambush fighter? You follow him after the ambush. I think we realize watching this Boachuk fight that Ortiz is better on his front foot than on his back foot. Right, a Virgil Ortiz might be able to use that front foot to his advantage against a rusty Jamel Charlo. Right, let's say Sebastian Fundora and Errol Spence, that fight falls apart. Well then, Ortiz could fight Sebastian Fundora if everyone's willing, right? Fundora has the world title, not an interim title. Fundamentally, too, you know, fighters need to know their market power. If I'm Ortiz, and I know we fought a long time to get this interim belt, he just went through hell, just got knocked down twice in a fight to get the title, right? If I'm Ortiz, I follow the market. In other words, the sanctioning body suddenly shows up and tells me, hey, we're going to strip you of this interim title. If you don't fight the guy who just gave you the hardest fight of your career, the guy who just knocked you down twice, if you don't fight him again, I believe fighters need to say, hey, what's this about? Everyone knows I'm a big threat. I'm still an unbeaten fighter at 154. Everyone knows I'm a big threat at 154. Right? If I were Ortiz, I'd say, hey, take it. Take the title. I'm not going to... I don't want to see Boachuk again, even at a bus stop. Unless we're fighting for the world championship. Right? I would pivot toward the rest of the division. Right? You're only young once. Don't give up your youth and set back your career because I'm telling you, Boachuk could well beat Ortiz in a rematch. 
Don't give up your career. Don't hurt your career just to get a few extra hundred thousand dollars. Maybe even a million dollars for a rematch against Boa Chuck. Right? Think about the future. Realize that the money's there for you to fight Errol Spence in Texas. You might be able to enter the ring with best in Texas on your trunks and actually have people in the stands firmly believe it if you can beat Spence. And where would that fight take place? How about Texas? Give your base something. Right? So, um, Virgil Ortiz, if I'm him, I pivot away from Boa Chuck. Right? Life's unfair. Fight guys in their 30s who will look good on your resume. Spence, Charlo. <laughs> right? Fight for a world championship. Fundora. Fight in front of a new market. Tim Zhu. Right? Make it happen. But don't fight the guy who just gave you the toughest fight of your career when it's not for a world championship. Right? I have the same advice for Fabio Wardley and Fraser Clark. If I were Joe Joyce, I would not hop back in the ring with Derek Chisora, right? Even though that fight paid well, even though that fight was exciting, Derek Chisora has me timed. Derek Chisora knows how to wait through my jab, even when he's on the ropes, and hit me with very hard counters, right? Fighters need to know when to say when. One of the worst ideas that a fighter had over the last two years was when Joe Joyce decided he was going to actually exercise his rematch clause to fight Zhili Zhang. Keep in mind, when Joyce fought Zhang the first time, he was already the mandatory contender. Why did he fight Zhang the first time? Then when he figured out that Zhang is a ringer, that Zhang can actually box, right? Let's remember, the first fight ends because Joyce has his eye blown up. Right? Jang's not intimidated by Joyce's punching power, his size, his jab, the things that bothered Dubois in his fight with Joyce, the things that bothered Joe Parker when he fought Joyce. Understand how close to the top Joyce was at the time. Once Joyce fought Zhang and realized those things didn't bother Zhang, even with the loss, Joyce could have convinced us that it was an off day. Right? Jang, you know, would go on, do his thing. Joyce should have said, okay, look, I'm still a big name. I've beaten Dubois. I've beaten Parker. Instead, Joyce, and this is what happens when you're a competitor. Joyce had an itch he needed to scratch. He thought, okay, let me take the rematch with Jili Zhang. The problem, of course, was Zhang wasn't afraid of him, now Zhang actually had familiarity with him. Suddenly, we learned about Zhang's right hand, didn't we? That's the one that closed the show in the rematch. Right? Boa Chuck knows Ortiz. He's not the person to fight. Right? If the sanctioning body wants their belt back, give it to them. Right? This isn't the division with a Goliath, right? This isn't 147 with Jaron Ennis, right? Where you say he's the top of the division, right? You know, he's the guy I need to fight. No, this is a decentralized division right now. To me, Virgil Ortiz has other options that carry big paydays that would look spectacular on a resume. Right? I'd stay away from Boa Chuck. If one of you gets the world title, okay, great. If it's a world title fight, fight your Huckleberry. Fight your boogeyman. Okay, we understand that. But if it's not for a world title, the minute you realize that the word interim is involved, player, pivot away. 
you know, thank Riyadh Season for respecting your work. Make sure they know, hey, look, you know, I'm always here for the right fight. But then explain to them, look, I'm in my mid-twenties. You know, I'm hoping to not just be champion, world champion. I'm hoping to be world champion for a long time. Now's not the time for me to fight Boachuk again. And no, I'm not, I'm not fighting after this last fight where some flaws were exposed, where I'm hitting the canvas more than once. I'm not fighting one of boxing's premier closers, Terrence Crawford, in my next match. I have work to do. I'd rather fight Crawford when he's a year older than right now. That's the approach I would take if I'm Virgil Ortiz. Let me hear from you. I hope you leave your comments in the comment section of this YouTube video. If I'm Boa Chuck, I take on all comers. Right? If I'm Boa Chuck and the phone rings, it can be Charlo. Right? It, it can be anybody. But not Virgil Ortiz. Right? That head-to-head -head matchup is just too draining. Save that for a world championship fight. Those are my thoughts. Let me hear yours in the, champion, in the comment section of this YouTube video. Thanks for stopping by.